name is Blanche Kluter. I am from Kiatman's work. And my name is Veronica Darks and I am also from Kiatman's. My name is Greta Kluter. It's important to us to come to Nama Festival because this is our culture, our heritage and our roots. We were born as Namas. And we are proudly Namas and we are here to celebrate our Nama Festival. My name is uh, Nikori Maskupa. I'm, I'm a Nama from Botswana. Uh, I'm here because I've been invited uh, to this festival, which I've attended uh, from its inception when they started their first installment in 2018. This festival is very important to us in the sense that we are the Namas in Botswana who have uh, partly lost language and culture. And having had of this festival, it gave us motivation and confidence in that indeed what we almost lost could be uh, restored uh, through the Namibian Nama Festival. Hello Namibia, I am Zandre Chausas from Kiatmanswa. I am a Steen Ecotourism World Namibia. I'm here at the Nama Festival celebrating the heritage, culture and values of the Nama people. Thanks to our local and regional political leadership of Harta and Karas for their prompt and heartfelt response in support of the preservation and promotion of Nama traditions and culture. Sadadi, my arisens, Sadadi, mi moiba budi, Sadadi, kuiba sen budi. I Isagi, Gaub Hansel, Tikari Gaub Vedbuip, Amsi, the Yedok Makam, Kangan Hasi, Paradok Kovanui, Nadima Hotel Toto Zahu, named Hangas in Hundiba, Iratina Dog, Kangan Hasibara, Kovan Utira Mark Haru, Tira Tarik Anda, Tis, Tuita Sons, Yagomais, Nasna Radok Anda, Tira Kangans, Sarangas Oma, T. The UNESCO country representative as well, we really, really thank and value your presence, your support that you have rendered for the festival by your presence here. Uh, so we acknowledge that as well. We therefore say, and we recognize that there's a need for a spiritual and a psychological healing that must first take place in our people. Therefore, we call upon us as communities in South Africa and Botswana to come together to establish a platform which we now can call an international Khoisan festival where our people from all of these areas must now start to come together so that we can strengthen ourselves and plan together how we can take our people out of the clutches of poverty. We also say and immediately call upon the political systems that we have in place, our governance structures, where these communities reside, to help us from a financial perspective so that we can put together a trust fund that must begin to work on all of these activities that we can put together. Thank 
ตะเกกองเอาเอเนกาจอสุตะมาหาตองเอาเสเดเกกิมอมกุตขะตระจีขุนกินเนนาเนตระเนมุนเกเซเมนต์ขะตระจีชิตระเซเมนต์หูอิน
their actions were justified because it was just subduing rebellious Nama groups. That is the information that goes on. And it is still exactly the same information that we are dealing with today. I want you to call in memory of your conscious mind the graphic picture of, your, of you losing your father, losing your mother, losing your uncle, losing your brothers. And as a young female facing this militant rapist slaughtering machine before you. And for many years that I have worked with the Nama traditional leaders for over 16 years, of which 13 were spent in the capacity as the SG, in intensive discussions of the dilemma facing the Nama people, the vicarious traumatic experiences that you feel by hearing the real conditions that people had endured. Next. That is exactly what motivates the Nama leaders to tell the Yemen's to face, uh, and to their face, to understand that what they call civilization was the cause of destruction to the Nama psyche. So the principle is that we need to, to be aware of who we are, be proud of that, so that when you can go and speak your language, and I can tell you uh, in, the, in, the, in the context of the Nama, when we go to international conferences, because we were involved, for example, in the nomination of the Nama music, which we presented to the Intergovernmental uh, Committee of UNESCO, and the, when they hear the clicks and the, the, the beauty of this language, I'm telling you, and the patches and the, the beautiful dresses of the Nama communities, the world was uh, overwhelmed. But if we are not proud of that, if we are not happy to go outside representing Namibia for any platform wearing our beautiful Nama dress, uh, they will not know and they will not appreciate that. So we need to be proud of uh, what we have. But all I'm saying is that we need to package our culture so that it's appealing and interesting for young people. Otherwise, uh, we will waste our time. Because the times, as the topic is saying, is the 21st century. And the young people are too they are quick these days. Social media, other things, they are preoccupied with other things. So if we want to have a space in their uh, world, we need to catch up with time. Organizations that the Heritage, Heritage Council of Namibia work with to involve the youth in the preservation of heritage and culture. We have to identify how, which, which, which approaches would be appealing to the youth so that they can be accepting of heritage and culture, appreciating it, and also um, having that willingness to preserve it. Um, we know that the youth is very tech savvy and um, I would like to mention an example that we introduced um, at our Tullifontein World Heritage Site um, and it was particularly during the time of COVID um, when uh, we couldn't travel around, tourists couldn't come to our destinations and we had to think of a different way to, to, to draw people to still experience the heritage and we introduced a the very first as a matter of fact um, the virtual uh, reality tour of Twin Fontaine. At the moment this tour is only available on site but it is one of the ways in which we could engage the youth because when they hear about digital and technology it's those type of concepts that you would want to use um, together in an association with heritage culture, we talk about it in two forms. You have the tangible culture, you have your intangible um, cultural heritage. And these are really, we really serve as, as a body to ensure that throughout the country, um, the diverse cultures that we are dealing with here in Namibia are really reserved, get the different platforms that they deserve so that we can continue keeping um, our cultures alive. Um, in our discussions, we have indicated that this um, the organization of cultural festivals, this festival that we are attending. For us in Botswana and South Africa, uh, we could only do that when we know that certainly what we have lost of, or almost lost, we are able to restore or recover because of Namibia. So my point here is that it is very important that this festival is jealously guarded and packaged very well so that we don't lose this touch. And uh, 
Being the heritage uh, council that you are, I'm wondering how you help communities, you know, to break it down. Sometimes when you say heritage tourism, an ordinary community member doesn't really tell you what it is. So you need to go to the communities and break it down and be able to package it, to assist them to package it. By leveraging upon culture, and I believe that that type of ideas really would do a lot as well. And um, in terms of the overall legal framework that was also shared, uh, the trade agreements and so on, it would really be interesting to see how we can really tra translate those uh, into actual gains uh, and, and, and for, for our people as a collective, because that would also in turn strengthen uh, the unity uh, amongst the nations, but also within the community as well. Well, this, this thing of um, um, the Namibian culture is not really sufficiently institutionalized in Namibia's education system. Uh, and that's uh, one of the drawbacks that we have. I would probably propose that uh, there should be a deliberate action plans in place to promote uh, cultural narrative in our education. Other countries that are making a life from the heritage started with uh, increased and improved investment in the, in the packaging of heritage and culture as a product. Because we are talking about the relevance of this sector and how it can be promoted through tourism and other means. But if we, don't, we do not invest in uh, creating a product that is marketable, then I think we would not be doing justice in terms of the uh, for, uh, trade and export of our cultural goods and services. The African Union also recognizes uh, culture and heritage as, as one of the priority and flagship programs for, for the organization. Uh, and we know that uh, one of the, the, the pillars is uh, the aspirations is to have a shared uh, and common value system uh, as far as heritage and culture is concerned for Africa. So the AU also uh, also recognizes the importance of, of this topic in, in the discourse of development. Uh, and again, uh, we fought to the extent that NDP5 as a standalone, had a, had a standalone uh, pillar uh, under the social uh, cohesion, uh, you know, social development pillar that recognized culture uh, as, a, as an enabler of, of development. And then on top of that it comes the professional competencies where we talk about applied knowledge, uh, technical skills that you, you acquire, uh, which will, could lead to self, for you to be self-sustainable uh, yourselves. That, I mean, if you have technical skills, you could um, go into business yourselves, you could be self-employed, you could employ others, uh, if that skill is sought after in the community. And then the next one, which is uh, complex functionalities that you could pick up from education is uh, problem-solving skills or abilities and then uh, self-learning skills. So if you can read and write and communicate properly because of education, you can obviously access a wealth of information that is available uh, with regards to the do's and the don'ts, uh, the, 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 the laws, the legal systems that are governing the individual um, and the communities at large. So that's uh, probably my uh, introductory remarks with regards to, to education. Thank you very much, Dr. Aysen. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Derek. So Mr. Derek just gave us a brief overview of our pre-colonial education system and how it was done and how the girl child or the boy child were educated. And then, um, in short, um, Dr. Aysen just gave us a little overview of our current education system. Okay. Um, just in um, short, Mr. Of Dr. Aysen, can you please just give us um, Okay, let me give this one to, Dr. to Mr. Dabsa. That is a mammoth task to do. It's a big challenge because of the dynamics of life that we are currently in. And so much damage that has been done to the systems that people lived during those days. Uh, we know about the damage of colonization, uh, how these systems were totally Damage and it was deliberately done. If I can recall, one British parliamentarian in the 1800s stated in the British Parliament, I have, he said, he crossed, uh, crisscrossed Africa and realized that the systems that the African societies have are so stable and solid 
uh, in terms of discipline. And, and the only way to overpower these people is to break their assistance. So that, that means there was a deliberate action is to destroy these systems, and it was done. And uh, that was during colonial times, but if we take the Namibian situation, even after independence, there was, in my personal view, no, no uh, real serious action as to, as to uh, remedy the situation of the education system. In fact, in my opinion, it wasn't. But at the end of the day, it was only six subjects that, that, that we used to, to, to determine whether you must progress or not. So many, imagine yourself, uh, if those learners only had six subjects, they could have done better in those six subjects and we could have a higher pass rate in grade 10. But if we take, for example, the January 2006 situation, where there was only 48 point something percentage that passed grade 10, there were more than 3,000 students that could not access the classroom for grade 11. So that has exposed the government situation. And, and when the late Dr. Abraham Yamo came as Minister of Education, he addressed the situation. He saw if we take 15,000 learners that are dropped out every day, and it, is government, uh, it was government orchestrated, he said we only need, if you take 30 learners in a class, 15,000, we only need. Uh, 500 classrooms. 500 times 30 give us the 15,000. And late Dr. Abraham Iyamo said, within the next five years, we must buy, build each year 100 classrooms. When you look at the whole education, I always think about a normal traditional tripod, three of them, the teacher, the child, and the parent. How do you link these legs together in order for it to foster the unit up here that will be able to deliver a valuable information that is useful to the person and retainable as well. Our teachers need to be experts on their subjects, but we often get a teacher that is not expert in that specific field, teaching that child that specific field. And you often get children going to Uncle Google and coming back with an answer and say, no, say, miss, this is not what Uncle Google said. But when you look at the Scandinavian countries, they tend to have specialist teachers. And we need to think about very much to have a mathematic teacher who will be able to teach a certain range of classes, only mathematics. Uh, some, I think, progressive or transformational leaders in education has described education basically in a paradigm shift as a, you know, uh, relevant education. I do not know whether all education is relevant for a specific setting. So education cannot be just education and it cannot be just a sweeping thing. It must be relevant education if you really want to produce human capitals at the end of the journey. Uh, for example, if you look at the, if you have ever read, because we are not also reading, the, Scandina the Scandinavian setting, for example, the molding of a child starts already at the first in the earlier grades, so that the child is being monitored. And education in those settings becomes not only a parental responsibility, it's also, it's, it becomes a community or, or community or so, 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 so society's responsibility. The middle, uh, um... Volunteers and young men say never pass never teach. That kind of work is good. We na raga wa ba ikwa never kai ni rewu. We na raga wa ba ichi na churu ro ba churu ro. Please, there are also bamboo say names. What bamboo? Like amutenga? I said no, nah, not like amutenga. The say name is bamboo. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh? You the number people you are discriminating against the bamboo and the kafara. It's not fair. Maybe we must go to the court. Okay, he, 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 not to the court. Not to the court, please. This guy, he also works for the court, my friend. Tauda go van hof, katra ko unisa ko buli ka tri. Tira ko na uko e ko na tira ite ne. Man, the story is like this, ne. I will tell the guy to rather make a declaration. Tira ko e ba lantro, trust by the declaration submit, ika. 
Man ware de gai in sal di se de skrai ta. So dai man mu sa verklare in skrai de ele brief skrai. Van sai au ba rodi was kafrin, au ba as kafrin, ba as kafrin ai ska. Ei, das erst du dai kafr. Sei kafr bas pun ta kai. Mu fire ka. Do ka kafra.